Hello. Thanks to everyone um, involved in organizing the series uh, for having um, invited me. It's an honor to be here for the wonderful day that I've spent with everyone. Um, I want to thank Jenny, um, Scott. I want to thank Noah, um, Solmaz, Julian, um, Sally. Did I say Matt? <laughs> um, Thank you so much. It's, it's really great to be back here. Um, so I've been on sabbatical um, this year. Um, I had from like the mid, the middle of December 2018 until about August of this year to work on a novel. Um, and so I decided that that's what I was going to share with you um, tonight. And I said at the talk earlier today that the novel is about cruelty. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, that the novel is about cruelty, um, and it was inspired by um, a particular act of cruelty that my brother, um, who worked at General Motors for 40 years, um, from the time he got out of high school until the time that he passed away at 58, he shared a story with me that I just had never forgotten. Um, and so that's what inspired the novel. And it takes place in Detroit, and it involves automotive um, manufacturing plants. Um, and um, I've been interested in how you know cruelty works, um, but as I also said um, earlier today, I'm becoming more and more interested not in cruelty, but in resistance to cruelty and how stories um, about cruel acts are passed on and how people survive. Because some of us can witness things that are horrible um, and process it and move forward, and some people just are crushed by it. So those are kinds of the things that I'm thinking about. Um, and so I'd like to read the opening, and then one short section from a little bit later. It starts with um, this epigraph from Shirley Jackson. Although the villagers had forgotten the ritual and lost the original black box, they still remembered to use stones. It was a year, like most years, full of savagery and wonder. Betty Biggs Munoz sat unmoving on the Cirquito interior. She was a passenger in a rented Ibiza, which was stuck in prolific traffic. Millions of cars motored the avenues and turnpikes of Mexico City that year, the city sinking perceptibly, then as now, into the muck on which the Spanish built it. Betty remarked about the city's leaning architecture, the way cathedral spires slanted against the sky, and she heard people like her husband, who was driving their rented Ibiza, joke that one day Mexico City would be swallowed by its underground lake. Locals shared this fact as amusement and oddball colonial history. Although Betty was neither historian nor fortune teller, she believed the prediction. She was inclined to believe weird prophecy. She believed, for example, that her fate was linked to her husband, Andres Munoz. Born in the late 60s in different countries, cultures, and time zones, Betty and Andres met in 1982 in an Algebra II classroom in southwestern Detroit. They fell in love solving inequalities. She noted back then that their respective birthplaces were both close to lakes. What she noticed on their honeymoon a decade later, as they sat in ridiculous traffic, was that both cities were obsessed with cars. Detroiters breathed cars, dreamed cars, designed cars, built cars, then shipped cars all over the planet. Mexico City had more vehicles crowding its streets than any other place in the world. Betty wondered what a city without millions of cars could be. Babe, she said, watch how you're driving. Andres swerved their sedan into four merging lanes. They came within inches of a silver Toyota. These maneuvers, she was learning, were customary here. Drivers seized the smallest space between cars. If their braking was imprecise, the resulting accident could cause a day-long traffic jam. Please get us there in one piece, Betty said. She felt lightheaded and had a strange taste in her mouth. She began to cough, 
Andres turned his head from the road to eyeball her. What's wrong with you, Bella? he asked. She wiped her mouth with the back of her hand. Altitude sickness. Can you pull over? No, I can't. No way to get over. Betty watched the traffic inch forward, then stop. Their car had no air conditioner, and the air held no breeze. Through her open window, the sun was a bright apricot. She stared at it, sweat beating across her face. Open the door, Betty. Puke in the street, Andres said. She listened to her husband's instructions, her head against the headrest. She was not about to vomit on the streets of a major city. Instead, she remained still for several seconds. Then she opened her door as if chased by fire, splattering her gut onto the pavement below. A motorcyclist swerved ever so deftly around her pink puke. Betty closed the door and slumped back into the seat. She recalled the biker's rabbit quick response. They don't teach that in driving school, she thought. An hour later, they drove onto the crowded streets of Xochimilco. A man who looked their age rode a bicycle up to their car and began speaking in Spanish to Andres. He was trying to persuade Andres to choose his pier as the place where they would get onto a boat. They were going to float for an hour in the canals. Although Andres had left Mexico when he was seven years old, he returned most summers and was at ease with his customs. He was negotiating with a bicyclist on the fair. After a back and forth, they agreed on a reasonable price. Andres then followed the man down the narrow roads to the dock where the cyclist would earn his cut. On their first date, Andres had told Betty that he wanted to take her to Xochimilco one day. You would like it, good people there, he promised. They were eating in a dimly lit restaurant in southwestern Detroit that was named after the Mexican town. Betty frowned when she learned this fact. There should be a rule, she said. She plucked a chip from their red plastic basket and dipped it in salsa verde. You shouldn't be allowed to name a restaurant after an actual place, she said. It's disparaging. It's a tribute, Andres said. The owners of the restaurant are from that town. But what if you don't know Xochimilco as a town? McDonald's is not a town. For my entire life, I've associated Xochimilco with margaritas and super nachos. Andres responded with his hands. He splayed them, palms up, his shoulders shrugged, and his head leaned to one side in the universal gesture, it is what it is. She loved his hands. They weren't pretty. They were thick-fingered and covered with dozens of small cuts from the work he did pulling tiles with his family's flooring business. But she liked how he animated them. He waved his hands in the air as he talked and he gently tapped his fingers on her forearm whenever he was making a point. His hands helped her now as she climbed out of their car. Feeling better, he asked. She nodded. Her queasiness was gone, but Andres insisted on walking her to a vendor in an alley where he bought her chili mango candies to rid her mouth of its weird taste. Then they walked to the canal. They paid their fare to a man sitting on a stool. Betty had not yet heard the story of the dead girl found floating in the canal. Newly married and on vacation, Betty boarded the red and yellow Trajanera without concerns. It was a flat bottom boat made of painted wood and named Carmelita. When the teenaged captain of the Carmelita began telling the story of the dead girl, Betty sat upright. What kind of spooky story was this? The teenager was speaking calmly in English, which belied the horror of the tale that he told. Wait, 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 she told him. Slow down and start again. The boy was about 16 or so, about eight years younger than she and Andres, and he was skinny with the quick and impatient gestures of the young. He started over. As he spoke, he pushed a bamboo stalk into the canal bed to move the flat bottom boat forward. The planks at the bottom of the boat fit together imperfectly, creating space at the seams where canal water seeped onto the boat to collect in a murky puddle. Betty kept her eyes on the water. Andres did not seem troubled by it, and neither did their captain. Instead, he kept talking, only slower now, like a storyteller before a campfire. He said that the girl had drowned, that the lake had spit her up, 
as an offering that an old man fished from the stream. Well, that's the legend, yes, Andres said. Right, a legend, the boy agreed. He continued with the story. The old man who found the girl thought her beautiful and sad, especially when he noticed her doll floating in the water beside her. People said the girl was karmic retribution from the Aztecs, the ancestors who'd built the waterways before the Spanish arrived. Wait, these are water routes created by Aztecs? Betty asked. She turned to Andres. You never told me that. You just said we would spend the afternoon sailing in a man-made canal. Well, I told you the modern city was built on top of a filled lake. That's different. Maybe I should have said the city was built on top of Aztec ruins. That part is fact. But this story about the girl and karma? Andres flapped his hands like wings. That story is just a myth. He didn't say it was a myth. Betty turned to look at the teen. Yes, yes, it's a myth, the boy said. Why is it myth? Did it happen or no? Betty asked. We don't know, Andres answered. No one I know has ever talked to the guy. It's a story, Betty, a story people tell over generations. Some of it is true, but most of it is probably untrue. Betty insisted that the story sounded true to her. Girls were killed all the time without public outcry. And the world advanced each day despite despicable acts. Floating dead girls, cities buried beneath cities, cops beating a motorist senseless just because they can. More importantly, she argued, this girl died as payment for the past. You know what the elders say, she reminded him. Universal law always settles the score. Andres listened quietly. You want to know why I never told you this story? I didn't tell you this story because I know you are gullible like this. You can't accept tragedy without spinning a superstition of some sort. Betty stared at him with her lips in a knot. She kept staring until he turned away. Boats crowded the canal around them. The boat riders danced and kissed openly near bottles of tequila and mezcal that covered the tables in the center of their ships. It was hot and the air smelled of the brown canal water and everything floating within it, shoes, worms, plastic cups, rope, fast food wrappers, plants, hair, gum. Betty started feeling woozy again. Look over there, that is a monument of the girl I was speaking of. The teen pointed to their right, then turned their boat in that direction. They drifted toward a house whose yard overflowed with garbage. As they pulled closer, Betty saw that the garbage was dozens of plastic dolls. Dolls were nailed to the fence, on trees, on bushes. Dolls, both clothed and naked, were strewn across the grass. Is this where the man who found the girl lives? Betty asked. No, he is said to live on Isla de las Muñecas, Island of the Dolls, which is a six-hour trip from here and back. He built a shrine to the girl on the island. This is a small replica of his shrine. Can we go to his island? Betty asked. We don't have time for that, Andres said. It's a six hour trip. What else do we have to do? It will cost you more money, their captain said, but I know how to get there from here. In the years that followed their honeymoon in Mexico, Betty would not trust her memory of Isla de las Muñecas. She'd gone there, but it seemed more like a dream. She would ask Andres three, four, and five years later if they'd actually gone to the island and seen the shrine or if she had fallen asleep and was only recalling the replica they'd seen in the canal. Her memory of the place was hazy. The images of that day, the puddle on the boat, the suspended dolls and trees were not sharply drawn in her mind, but were more like images seen through curtains of snow. Andres said that she'd fallen asleep as they traveled to the island, but that she definitely awakened once they arrived. He said the teenager pulled the boat onto the shore and they disembarked. They'd seen hundreds of dolls that someone had assembled into giant, gnarled sculptures. But they never encountered an artist or any humans living on the island. They only saw other tourists. Most of them were drunk and they stumbled around the dolls, laughing and taking photos. Betty remembered little about their trip, and she couldn't distinguish her memory of Isla de las Muñecas from her memories of a neighborhood in southwestern Detroit. A local artist there also made sculptures with abandoned objects, 
but his sculptures weren't limited to dolls. His art included tires, car parts, shoes, and all manner of trash found in the city streets in the 1970s and 80s. These sculptures were erected near a manufacturing district where smokestacks belched fire into the sky. Sometimes memories blur together, Betty complained one winter in 1994. She'd been in a blue funk all that day. They get scrambled, she said to Andres, who had learned not to listen closely to her ramblings. An NBA game was on their television. Andres sat watching the game. Betty paced in the middle of the floor. I may confuse memories at times, but I tell you what, she said. That story about the girl in the canal, that's as clear as a beam of light. I will never forget that. There it was, a story that sums up how karma actually looks. Bella, please, not today, Andres said. In his lap, their daughter Frida, then 16 months old, was curled like a comma and fast asleep. You don't see it, Andres, because you don't want to. I don't see it because it's not real. It's superstition. Tia Evie practices Hezekos, you know that. I don't believe in that stuff, Betty, Andres said. What about the police here that beat and killed Omar Dunn? How do you explain that? In a city where we have a black mayor, city council, and black cops, for God's sake. We have all this progress, but you know what? It's built on top of bad karma. And every now and then, a fucking body floats to the surface. Andres lifted Frida into his arms and walked with her to her bedroom. Betty paced alone in their living room. The bulls were beating the pistons once again. Outside their bay window, the short-lived life of the first snowfall. Um, all right, so during um, my sabbatical, I was able to visit two auto plants, um, one in San Antonio and one in Dearborn, Michigan. Um, and I was telling Matt earlier that I'd written some pages where I imagined being inside a plant after doing like some, you know, Google research and seeing pictures and that kind of stuff. But then when I went, I had to kind of like throw some pages out. Um, but anyway, I wanted to tell you that before I read this next section, because this is a section that it is about um, manufacturing. Um, and the other thing I'll say to set this up is um, that when I applied for the MFA program here, I was um, actually deep into writing poetry um, and was, um, I think in my second year at, at Kaveh Kanem and was trying to consider whether I should apply to poetry or fiction and decided I wasn't good enough to be a poet. Uh, so I went with fiction, but I am pulled by lyricism all the time. Um. Making a truck, making thousands of trucks, means standing on your feet and bending and contorting your body, your only body, to do the same highly particularized job for hours each day in order to fashion the plastic molding inside a vehicle or install its motor controls or perform any of the hundreds of other tasks needed for a steel product that weighs nearly one ton and could crush you should it fall. Tasks like fabricating glass and mirror components and parts, running presses, pinching and securing wires for routing, testing engines for leaks, visually inspecting parts for defects, operating torque guns, programming and operating ergonomic arms, lifting 40-pound machinery, lifting and hoisting engines into a frame, operating a rivet gun or cordless drill, reaching over your head with your head tilted back as you screw a bolt into the dark belly of a suspended truck, attaching door handles, loading packaging machines, unloading packaging machines, making gauge needles for instrument panels, building sub-assemblies, bolting, cutting, stamping, sewing, clipping, cementing, or otherwise fastening parts together each day, and doing this job repeatedly until it thins your ligaments, swells your joints and feet, until you have vertigo, headaches, tinnitus, 
hearing loss, a torn ACL, weak knees, lung cancer, drug addictions, until your arm hurts and your spine stiffens, then refuses to rotate, which means your back won't work, and the policy is you can't sit down because collectively, as a union worker, you gave up the six-minute break time in 2009, and beyond physical stamina, this job requires no demands that you commit some part of your mind and heart to an unshakable belief in the logics of global capital, which means on a smaller scale, you commit some part of your mind and heart to an unshakable belief in the necessity of placing a two-inch needle into an instrument panel over and over and over again, the repetition itself a type of holiness, as if these daily acts which destroy you ounce by ounce and breath by breath are your destiny, as if your highly particularized repetitive acts are the inevitable calling of your life, your destiny owned by men with untold power, so long as you both may live. Thank you. Thank you.